today, I thought I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about prayer. And uh, as you all know, last week, I shared a little bit of announcement on some of the changes of the prayer tower. Today, I want to go a little bit deeper into that. Actually, last weekend itself, I wanted to preach uh, on this. I want to talk about prayer and the prayer tower. But uh, as we approached last week, I felt led to share the word I shared last week instead. Um, but today, I want to share about prayer, talk a little bit about our prayer tower. And I really want us to catch the heartbeat behind prayer, the heartbeat behind why we as a church started this whole thing called the prayer tower. Now, some of you, you may be newer to FCBC and not quite sure what I'm talking about. Well, over this message, I'm going to come explain to you what this is all about. And so I was thinking, what do I call this message? And I was just thinking about it and I decided to just call this message this, come pray with me. Come and pray with me. Because I think that's the heartbeat behind why we have the prayer tower is for people to come together, to pray together in unity and as a, a, a family. So I want us to take out our Bibles. We're going to look at a part of Scripture. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to, to 44, right? Matthew 26, 36 to 44. And this is what it says there. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Verse 40, then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Well, let's join our hearts together and pray and commit this time to the Lord's hands. Lord, we thank you for this word. And we ask that these words will not just be mere words or printing on a piece of paper, but Lord, it will come alive. It will, it will capture our, our very spirits, our very souls, and Lord, it will transform us. So Lord, we commit this time to your hands. Come and teach us. Come and speak to each and every one of us. Open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts, oh Lord. We thank you for this time. In your most precious name, we pray. Amen. So what we've just read was what we see is that Jesus was basically asking three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to have a moment of prayer with him. Literally, come pray with me. And the background of this entire episode here would be that Jesus was struggling in this, at this point of time. You know, he, he said these words that this, his sorrow was to the point of death. And so in some sense, you might say that Jesus was going through a, a crisis at that point of time. And in this crisis, what he wanted most from his disciples at that point was not just for them to be with him, but for them to be with him in prayer. Now, why is prayer important? Why is prayer important when we go through a crisis, we go through a situation? Prayer is important because prayer deals with issues on a spiritual level or it deals with spiritual matters of our lives, spiritual matters of, of well, the world around us. Now, you think about it, in life, we have many different aspects. There's the spiritual, there's the physical, there's our emotional, there's our mental or our cognitive aspect. There are all these different things. And we often look out for these different things. For example, to make sure that our mental faculties are constantly engaged. You know, we do different activities. You can watch a show, you can uh, uh, read a book, learn a new skill. That exercises that. At the evening time, we rest. You know, in, in, at night, we sleep. When we, when we rest, we sleep. We rejuvenate our bodies, our physical bodies. And uh, probably when we get enough rest, our emotions are also taken care of. And so all these things are, are take care of that. But what about our spirits? You know, we can, we can sleep and sleep and sleep, but that doesn't necessarily mean our spirits will be rejuvenated. We can learn as many skills as we want. We can have all the knowledge in, that world, in the world. It doesn't mean that our spirits will be revitalized or be rejuvenated. See, when it comes to the spiritual, 
prayer is what brings that about. Prayer amongst many other spiritual disciplines. There's a reason why we call them spiritual disciplines. Spiritual issues need to be taken care of by spiritual disciplines, one of which is prayer. We often quote this part of scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which reminds us of this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what this passage is talking about here is that our struggle is not against the physical, but there's this spiritual aspect of things. There's, we, we, have, we, we, we as living beings, we're not, we're not just human bodies, we're human beings. Our beings consist of our physical side, our emotional side, our mental side. It includes our spiritual side as well, our souls. And in this spiritual part, we must make sure that our spiritual aspect is looked after for as well. You know, if we come back to Jesus, after Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane, what would happen? He would be arrested, he would be beaten, he would be tortured, he would eventually be executed by crucifixion. But the real struggle that he had was not against the people who were torturing him, who were beating him or, or whatever it is, and Jesus recognised that. You see, what, what was one of the last things that Jesus said when he was on the cross? Luke chapter 23, verse 34. It says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Forgive who? He was talking about the people who, were to who had tortured him, the people who had put him on their cross. He was asking God to forgive them. Now, what, the fact that Jesus said this clearly shows us that he understood that the struggle is not against flesh and blood. His struggle he was not against those people, but he knew that his struggle was against something spiritual. It was against this spirit of hatred, spirit of malice, this spirit of fear, spirit of anxiety, a spirit of anger, a spirit of, 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 of wanting revenge or whatever it is. That was the true enemy. That is what our struggle is actually against. You see, you think, think about it, all right? Very often when, let's say somebody betrays you, somebody hurts you, you know, and we, we, this, these emotions just build up within us. They build up and we, we kind of say, I hate that person, you know? But the, the thing is, we are, we are distracted from the real issue. The issue at hand is not that person, you know? The issue at hand is that a spirit of hatred, a spirit of anger has to come upon you. I mean, we've heard about people before where somebody has hurt them and they, they say, oh, you know, you've hurt me, I must hurt you back. I must make sure that I get my revenge. I must, I must do unto you what you've done unto me. I must make sure you suffer as well. But there are people who have done this and yet they don't feel any better. Why? Because killing that person, hurting that person, doing whatever to that person doesn't solve the fact that you're still hurt. It doesn't solve the fact that inside you, you still have that spirit of anger, that spirit of hatred. Maybe for that moment, you feel a bit better. Maybe you feel like there's a bit of catharsis there. You, 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 oh, you let that, 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 that emotion go loose for that moment. But yet, that spirit of anger is still within you. Now, what does the Bible remind us of? In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, one of love and one of a sound mind. Now, when we talk about this spirit here, yes, it could, it, it, it covers all kinds, it talks about a sense of fear. It also talks about, um, it also talks about these demonic presences that are around us that causes us to feel these different emotions. You see, we talk about, we can, these, these presences can give us this sense of fear, this sense of anger. And you know what? For us to overcome that, we cannot defeat it physically. We must overcome it spiritually. And the way we do that is that we must be in prayer. We must pray and ask God to deliver us, to help us through all this. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, we commonly say this, these words, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. See, it talks about how as we pray, you know what? As we pray, as we seek God, something changes within us. You see, because it's a spiritual issue at hand. Now listen to this. Uh, listen to this. It's very interesting here. 
And, and, and I want us to get this here because we often like to quote Philippians chapter 4, okay? I like, you look at this here, right? And uh, if you look at verse 7 there, okay, it talks about how you pray and it says, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind. Now notice this, this passage never said that as you pray, everything will change, everything will go according to what you want, everything will be in your favour. The Bible never said that. But what Scripture says is that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because the truth is this, there'll be emotions that are at play. The truth is this, you will still feel hurt. You will still feel angry. You will, feel, you will still feel upset. But in those moments, when this spirit of fear, this spirit of anger, this spirit of hatred, this spirit of malice is upon you, what do you need? You must seek God. You must seek out His Spirit and His Spirit will help guard your heart and your mind so that you will not fall prey to these things. That is something very important that we must understand. It's not that prayer like that magically fixes everything. Well, we can pray and God can move in ways we cannot even imagine. Can we pray and God will completely flip around the situation? Of course. He is God. He can do anything. He's, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But yet, even if nothing changes, what we do know is this. As we pray, the Spirit of God will be upon us to guard our hearts and our minds. And we can resist the devil. We can resist that temptation. We can resist these evil spirits that are trying to mess us up, is trying to lead us down a wrong path. See, when we understand this, then we know why Jesus could endure all that he did. Listen, uh, what did Jesus do? Jesus, when he was struggling, when his, he said, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, what did he do? He went to pray. Why? Because he recognizes that this is a spiritual issue that needs to be resolved. So he goes and he prays. Now notice this. He prays, right? What did he say? He says, God, if this cup can pass me by, may it pass me by. Basically, can I don't get crucified? God, uh, sorry, Jesus prayed. In fact, it's recorded there. He prayed three times. He, said, he prayed the same thing every single time he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he prayed, did his situation change? No. He still will be arrested. He still will be brought away. He still will be beaten, tortured, and finally he will still be crucified. His situation did not change. But, something changed within him. The spirit of peace came upon him. I mean, the spirit of peace came upon him and now what happens was that he was one with God. Remember his prayer is Lord, if it's possible, may this cup pass me by. Yet not my will, but yours be done. He was praying, he was pouring out his struggle and as he poured out his struggle, how did God, how did God bring him that peace? By aligning him. He says, not my will, but yours be done. It was a theologian, A.W. Pink, who said this, Real prayer is communion with God so that there will be common thoughts between His mind and ours. What is needed is for Him to fill our hearts with His thoughts and then His desires will become our desires flowing back to Him. See, that's, that's what happens, that when we pray, we become one with the Lord. We are in communion with Him and we align ourselves to Him. God aligns our spirits to Him. And that's where we receive the spirit of peace, that spirit that comes from God, that spirit of, of resolution, that spirit of, 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 no, of confidence, that spirit of love, that spirit of power, that spirit of having a sound mind, that comes upon us. And so that's exactly what happens to Jesus. Because if you look at Jesus in these two places, all right, I've been talking about two different places. One is what was happening to Jesus in Gethsemane, the other place is what happens to Jesus on Calvary, all right? The cross of Calvary on, the, on top of that hill where Jesus was crucified. Now, we see a contrast, actually. And let's take a look at this. Gethsemane and Calvary, all right? At Gethsemane, what does Jesus say? Jesus calls his, uh, 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 Peter, James, and John, and he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And basically, what was going on was that he was in that place of a struggle. He was struggling probably emotionally, spiritually, uh, in every different aspect. But by the time it comes to Calvary, when he's, good, when he's being crucified, what are his words? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And that is one of peace. In fact, later on, as Jesus passes, passes away, he literally would say, Father, into thy hands I commit my, my spirit. There's a sense of peace right there. You see, he's moved from struggle to peace. Now, what happened in between there? Jesus prayed. 
Jesus went to seek the Father. He sought the heart of the Father. And just like A.W. Pink said, it talks about how there'll be common thoughts between us and God. Our thoughts become His thoughts, or rather His thoughts become our thoughts. His desires become our desires. That's talking about alignment right there. And so when we pray, our spirits become aligned with the Spirit of God. And I want to point this out to us again. I, I was prepare, as I was preparing this, I, I came across this other uh, a priest from days gone by and, and he was talking about this thing about prayer. You see, we always pray and like I said just now, Jesus prayed. He prayed three times for this to pass him by, yet God's will be done. And in, this, in the end, this thing didn't pass him by. He still had to, to go on the cross. He still had to be tortured. He still had to be beaten. And I like what this priest says. This priest, his name is Samuel Shoemaker. He says this, prayer may not change things for you, but it sure changes you for things. <laughs> How beautiful is that? Prayer may not change things for you, but it sure changes you for things. I think that's just so beautiful. And really, as we pray, really, it's about us having that alignment with God's Spirit. Now, there's a lot more we can teach about prayer. And in fact, I've been talking to my dad. We've been thinking of finding an opportunity to come and do a more in-depth teaching on prayer. And not just prayer, but this whole idea of spiritual warfare, the importance of prayer and intercession. And hopefully in the next month or so, we're looking for the best time to come and bring us a teaching about this because we must understand that spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare is something that is very tangible. It's something very real. For example, um, as you know, for the past just over a year already we've been running these Sing Fu Cell to outreaches and with that we've seen a lot more people hearing the gospel a lot more people receiving this message of God's hope a lot more people getting baptised and so on we see God moving in an amazing way but yet interestingly as we send people out similarly we see more people facing setbacks and obstacles people who, who we, I mean we have, we have leaders and people in our church who, who are perfectly healthy but suddenly they, the moment they start reaching out to people suddenly sicknesses come upon them is this a coincidence I don't think it's a coincidence because there are spiritual forces at work like Ephesians 6, 12 says our struggles are not against flesh and blood but against these spiritual forces that is at work all around us. These things do exist and we must understand the reality of spiritual warfare so that we can really advance as this army of God doing what God has called us to do. Before we enter into a place, before we start some outreach, we must ensure that we pray and we intercede and we say, God, lead us, guide us, watch over us during this entire time. Now, I'm looking forward to all these teachings that we're going to have uh, uh, whenever we are able to, to plan it out for us. But I, I, I really am looking forward to that. But everything I've shared so far, this is just sort of like an introduction, a preamble, basically. I want to just give us a basic understanding of why prayer is so important. But like I said at the start, today I want to go a bit deeper into what I mentioned about the prayer tower last week. And I want to explain to us the significance of the prayer tower, all right? So let's come back to talking about this uh, uh, prayer tower. Now, like I said, some of you who are joining us, you are newer uh, on this live stream, you, or maybe you've been in FCBC already, but you came to FCBC maybe a year ago, in the last year, or maybe in the last two to three years, and you are somewhat familiar with the prayer tower, but we're not quite... We are not quite clear why do we do it or how did it even start. And so, well, today I'm here to tell us a little bit of a story of how this whole thing came about. Now, in, if you're not aware, FCBC with this thing called a prayer tower. Now, it's not a literal tower, but it is a physical space that we have here in, in Touch Centre. It's one of our rooms and it's a physical space where prayer goes on, where there's continuous prayer and worship 24 hours a day. It's not exactly seven days a week because previously we will always go off-site over the weekends because we do need that room for our weekend services as well. And the whole idea for this time is that during this time of prayer, we're praying for the church, we're praying for my family, which we're very appreciative of. We're praying for our nation and the nations around us. We're praying for current issues. We're praying for the leadership of our nation and so on and so forth. And all this started back in 2012, all right? All the way back in 2012. Now, what happened in 2012 was that earlier that year, 
we had gotten connected with this entire movement called Empowered 21. I think some of us know that we're familiar with it. Uh, and that year itself, we had been over to Indonesia where we visited a church, uh, a church called GBI, uh, Greater uh, Bethel Indonesia. And it's the senior pastor is Pastor Nico Nyoto Rohajo. And I think some of us, we, we remember him because he has spoken at some of our conference before and he's come to our church to minister before as well. And uh, it's a, he, he passes a, a huge network over there in, in Indonesia. And when we visited them for their conference, we realized we learned about this thing called the prayer tower. And they had this prayer tower there where there will be 24 hours, seven uh, days a week worth of prayer and worship. And the idea behind that, they, they weren't just there just to pray for their own church or their own needs. Yes, they pray for people there. They pray for their, their, the needs of their church. But beyond that, the purpose of it was to pray for their nation. And the idea is that so that in their nation, at any given time, there is always prayer being lifted up. That there's always like this, this it's, like, it's like a fire that, that never goes out. It just keeps burning. This prayer keeps on going on. So they, they, and that was their heart behind it. They want at any given point in time, there's always prayer in the land of Indonesia. And so when we were there, we saw it and, and we learned many different things for them. And the church leadership, we came back, we were convicted that this is something that Singapore needs as well. We want to be able to say that, look, Singapore, we must have prayer that's covering our nation all the time. Prayer that's going on. There should always be a time where, where we are covered in prayer. And so we came back. We started thinking of how we can bring this about. We started working with different churches and actually out of that, as we started talking with different churches, we kind of see a new movement of, of prayer coming up. So on the Love Singapore side, we've actually started a, a morning prayer at, at Kamya Methodist Church and people are coming before they, they, they go to work. Uh, but at that point in time, we started these different things with different churches. But our church, we didn't quite have a plan to start uh, the prayer tower yet. However, something happened that year, which I'll give you some background on it. Something happened that year, 2012, okay, those of us who were around then, if we recall, that was the year that we shut down the church for 40 days, for a time of repentance, for a time of restoration, for a time of a renewal within our spirit. Now, why did that happen? That happened because there were some, there, there were some prevailing cultures in our church that was, well, very, very wrong, if I would say so myself. And we saw it and we said we had to, to address that. I remember when we saw it, myself or my dad uh, or other pastors, it, it, we see it, it's, so, it's so bad that it, it pains us and we say we cannot in any good conscience carry on worshipping like that. Let me explain just one of the things that, that was going on during 2012. Back then, I was already serving as the worship pastor, so I was leading worship quite uh, frequently. And I remember back then, back then in 2012, we had here Touch Centre, and back then at Bukit Merah, it's not Gateway Theatre yet, it was Touch Community Theatre. And I remember when I went, when I would be assigned to lead worship at Touch Community Theatre, you know, we used to take turns which side, the master side, one week is TC, the other week is TCT. And back then, I remember at the 9 a.m. service on Sunday morning, when we start worship at 9 a.m., right, maybe 100 or 200 people are there. Generally, our morning service at TCT will see close to 1,000 people, even more than 1,000 people. But when worship starts, it's only about 100 to 200 people there. It was sparse. People are not coming. And over the next half an hour, people will slowly stream in. And the bulk of the people would enter close to sermon time. It means that most of worship, they were not around. They come in during... Which, and, and we saw this, this happen they are, every single week. We see it going on and we saw it becoming more and more prevalent in our, in, in, and more and more prevalent in our church. And we said we had to do something because this is not something that honours the Lord. And so we said, we're going to shut down the church for 40 days. In those 40 days, there's no cell meetings, there's no church services. But in those 40 days, we're going to have non-stop prayer. And in our time of prayer, we're going to come, we're going to repent of of, of these attitudes. We're going to ask God to restore us. We're going to ask God for a renewal of our spirits. And so we did that for 40 days. And after 40 days, we opened up the church again. Cell groups resume, services resume. But we thought that now as we've done 40 days worth of prayer, this is a good time to keep this prayer tower going. And so we launched the prayer tower. This aspect of prayer kept on uh, uh, going on in that season. And, and that's where it basically started. And I, I mean, at that point in time, I was not exactly in the senior leadership team of the church, but I, I was aware of all this because I was part of the planning team. Uh, I was, like I said, I was the worship pastor. I also had been to Indonesia to visit uh, uh, Pastor Nichols' church and their prayer tower. So we had seen all that. And, and 
that's when we launched it. So 2012, we launched it and it's been eight years so far. And I just want to say this, we're very thankful for all of you because all the, the entire church, you guys have been keeping this fire going and we really are so appreciative of it. We really thank God for each and every one of you. But as I carry on, now I want to get to what I really wanted to share. I wanted to share with us, what is the significance of the prayer tower? Why is the prayer tower so significant? Well, there are two things I want to share with us this morning. And what is two things? Number one, the prayer tower significance is significant because it reveals the importance of cell group prayer. The importance of cell group prayer. Now, what do I mean by, by this? Earlier on, as we read about Jesus together with Peter, James and John, what we're really reading about is small group prayer. Okay, so Matthew 26, verses 37 to 38. Jesus took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. What Jesus did was he put these guys aside. He said, Come and, and spend this time with me. Let's be in prayer. Keep watch with me. All right? Now, let's think about it. Jesus didn't, he didn't get all the 12 to go with him. He only got a small group. Okay? Secondly, um, he, Jesus didn't just stand up in front of everybody and say, hey guys, let you know, you know, I'm struggling right now. My sorrow, my grief is, is to the point of death. Can y'all please pray for me? He didn't say that. He actually went off to pray and he brought a small group along with me. That's why this message I call, I call it, come pray with me. There's an aspect of small group prayer here uh, uh, in, this, in this passage. And of course, for, for our church, a small group is called a cell group. A cell group is the basic unit of, of, of our church. And this is showing us about small group prayer. And now I want to talk about this because there is a significance to cell group level or small group level prayer, whatever you want to call it. There's a significance, there's an importance in that. Because one of the thoughts that people have mentioned is, hey, yes, we agree prayer is important, but let's, let's just do more prayer meetings then. We can have, to have more prayer meetings, can make it more frequent. Yes, we can do that. But a prayer meeting is a little bit different. Now, if you've been around with us long enough, back in the expo days, you remember we used to have our uh, uh, church-wide prayer meetings in expo itself. We would see about 5,000 over of us gathering together there and we would have a, 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 like a, a two hours worth of prayer. In recent years, I, we've launched this thing called the Prayer and Worship Night. We have been using that time to pray and we also see, still see about 4,000, 5,000 of us gathering together over those sessions to come and pray and worship the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong, these things are great. I love them. I love, I love a big event as much as the next guy, all right? But there is a difference. There is a difference between what we do at the prayer tower and a prayer meeting. See, that in this large gathering, it's a very different setting as to small group prayer. See, in this large group setting, yes, we're there as a collective. We're praying there as a collective. But take note of this. If we have a prayer meeting for the entire church, well, who's going to be leading it? Well, one person or two persons or maybe a group of people out of how many thousands of us? You see, in general, when we go for a prayer meeting, most of us will be attending as a participant. Who owns the leadership of that point? The pastor, the leader, whoever's up here on stage. The ownership rests on that person. Nothing wrong with that, but like I said, it's different. But when you come to our prayer tower, what happens there? We're not going there as participants. When your cell group is on duty, you're not going there as a participant. What's, you're going there to lead it. The ownership is on you. There's no pastor there to, to, to lead it. There's no pastor there to take over. No, it's us. We are it. The cell group is it. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it's a big, smell, a big cell or a small cell. It doesn't matter how many people we, we, we have there. We are, we are it. We're the ones running it. You know, and, and I think that's a great difference right there because I would want uh, the ownership of this to fall on the small groups, to fall on the cell groups because I don't want us to build up a church whereby only a few people lead prayer, where a few people have been trained and taught how to lead prayer. Only the pastor knows how to lead prayer. Only the, the some, some, some 144 leaders or whoever, only these people know how to lead prayer. No, I want to see a church being built up where every person knows how to pray, where every person leads in prayer where every cell group owns the prayer for the church that is the kind of church that we should be building up the kind of church that we should be raising up every single person should be familiar with prayer and intercession we all know Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 maybe we don't know the exact reference but we often say this Matthew 18 verse 20 says for where two or three are gathered together in my name I am there in the midst of them 
We often quote this, but what is the context there of this small group, two or three people? The context here is about spiritual warfare, it's about prayer and it's about intercession. Because if you go up to verse 18 onwards, Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 to 20, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This passage is really about prayer. It's about spiritual warfare. When it says in verse 18, whatever you bind in heaven will be bound on earth. Whatever you lose in heaven will we lose. All these things talking about spiritual warfare. It goes on to say that if you agree on anything that you ask, what is this ask talking about? It's talking about prayer, all right? Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Here it's pointing out a certain gathering of a small group, seeking the Lord, praying and interceding. That's what this is all about. See, there is, it is important to have cell group prayer, to have prayer owned by the basic unit of the church and not just something that's always a big event. Like I said, I, I'm fine, I'm love. I, I love to have all these prayer and worship nights I, and I want to continue with them. I love to have conferences and all that. But in the end, we must break it down to the smallest unit of the church, which is a cell group. A cell group must know how to pray. A cell group, more than just knowing how to pray, must own that aspect of prayer. And that's the beauty of the prayer tower. For quite a number of years, I, I mean, prior to me becoming deputy senior pastor and senior pastor as a cell leader, our, 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 my own cell group was engaged in a prayer tower, so we'll be, we'll be leading prayer. Quite often, I used to take the Sunday afternoon slots, the 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. I finished praying, i sorry, I finished preaching on the weekend and then I'd do the 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, slot for the, for the prayer tower. And... And after that, when I started preaching more and more and I became deputy senior pastor and all, I still continued to visit the, the, the prayer tower for a season. After a while, I stopped going to the prayer tower that much. I'll tell you why. Because I, I like going to the prayer tower because when I go to the prayer tower, I feel a sense of peace, a certain sense of solace there. Uh, and, I, and I do feel connected. I do feel a certain anointing there after all that prayer has taken place there. I do feel that anointing there. I do feel a connection with God. So very often, I will go in there to, to seek the Lord before the weekend for my for my message that weekend and so I, I but i used to do that more often i stopped after a while because um apparently by me going there i caused a lot of undue stress upon some uh leaders who were leading those different prayer tower segments one time i walked in there uh i just popped my head in and the prayer leaders was speaking halfway saw me and just stopped like I just stopped. Okay, stopped talking, and suddenly, like, very, got very, got got very stressed. You know, but for for those times that I was there, it it was it was really heartwarming. You know why? I've been there, and I've seen youth groups own it. I've seen our other cell groups own it. I've seen our elderly cell groups own it as well. I've seen elderly people lead me in prayer. I've had youth lead me in prayer. I've had leaders lead me in prayer. I've had people who aren't even leaders lead me in a time of prayer as well. And, and it, was, it was great. In fact, sometimes some of the testimonies you hear me sharing on the weekend are testimonies I heard being shared at the prayer tower as a thanksgiving or as something to encourage the people to, to, to trust in God, to have faith. And, and it's just really, it's really enjoyable. And I think that's the beauty of the prayer tower. That Prayer is not owned by well, some prayer department, you know. Or we have one particular team of, of pastors or a particular team of people in the church. These are the prayer people. Only the prayer people will do prayer. The rest of us, we don't do prayer. That's, that's not what the cell church is all about. The, the, a church like ours, everybody, we, we, we are trained in everything. We do all these things. We don't have just, oh, I, I'm the prayer person. You are the evangelism person. You are the cell group person. You are the preaching person. No, we, 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 we carry all this together. And it's so beautiful when I go in there. Being led by different people seeing different cell groups, different uh, 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 demographics of people, different uh, mix of cell groups there, leading worship, praying together. It's just so heartwarming. And that's, that's the kind of church I want to see. That our church is one where this is owned by all the cell groups down the line. So that's the first thing that I want to share. What is, what makes, why, why is this prayer tower so significant? Well, because the prayer tower teaches us the importance of cell group prayer. The importance of coming together as a small group, not just to fulfill a duty, but to own this spirit, this heartbeat of prayer. But now there's a second thing that I want to share as to why prayer tower is so significant. Because prayer tower teaches us the importance of continuous prayer. 
continuous prayer. That's why when we started this whole thing, it's something that goes on 24 hours as much as possible because we want this prayer to go on continually. Now, we're reminded in Scripture, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, we all know this. What does it say? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We've heard this verse many times. We've heard it many times. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Now, it says there we must pray without ceasing. Let me ask us all this question. We know this verse, but how many of us can actually say that we live it out? That we pray without ceasing. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? It means non-stop. I'll tell you this, none of us. None of us can say that we've actually lived this out because it's not possible to actually pray without ceasing. But that's where we must understand the context of this entire passage. Remember a few weeks ago, I think, teach about Bible study, I talk about how we must observe certain things, observe certain way things are phrased or certain keywords that are being used. Let me show you something that is repeated constantly in this chapter here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, it starts off saying this, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, that word is used there, okay? In verse 12, it says, and we urge you, brethren, and then in verse 14, just before we read that part about praying, uh, praying without ceasing, verse 14, it says, Now we exhort you, brethren. Now, what does the word brethren here mean? When the Bible talks about brethren, it's talking about the brothers and sisters in Christ. It's talking about us Christians. It's talking about us as a collective. Now, this is an important observation. And I'll elaborate a bit more about it shortly. There's an important observation there. Now, the other important point for us to keep in mind, all right, is for us to understand what this book, 1 Thessalonians, is all about, or rather, who wrote it and what's its purpose and all. Now, the book of 1 Thessalonians is not the first book written by a man by the name of Thessalonians, okay? It's not. No, Thessalonians were a, a group of people, like, like, just like Singaporeans, all right? Singaporeans, we come from, from Singapore. Thessalonians were people who come from a place called Thessalonica, all right, that is the place. And so, remember, I think it was last week, or was it the week before? I can't remember. But I was teaching us that Paul wrote much of the New Testament. And much of the New Testament were, are called epistles, or they're called letters. These are letters that Paul wrote to particular groups of people. You would have him writing letters to an individual, okay? Or you would have him write a letter to a group of people. So when this book is called 1 Thessalonians, it's the first letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Thessalonica, who they were called Thessalonians, okay? And so why, why am I saying this? The point here is that when Paul writes that we must pray without ceasing, well, firstly, it was, it was part of an entire letter he wrote to the Thessalonians, the Thessalonian Christians. Number two, in that whole passage, he's addressing a group of people. See, for us to truly have prayer that never ceases, it cannot be done by one person. It must be done by the body. It must be done through unity. It must be done by us coming together. That's the only way that we can have continuous prayer. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm happy to say that I think we have been accomplishing something close to this, where our prayer tower by different cells, different ones of us being engaged in it, coming down different cells, owning these time slots, this prayer continues on and on. That is that, that prayer, prayer that never ceases. Now let's come back to, to, to Gethsemane. I want to show us something interesting uh, right there and why it's so interesting is because it's mentioned elsewhere in Scripture as well. Uh, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus said this to Peter, James, and John. He said, Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Now, what I've highlighted there is, are these words, keep watch and pray. Now, it's so interesting because this notion of keeping watch is found elsewhere in Scripture as well. When it says keep watch here, it means to stay alert. Okay, to stay alert, to be awake, to be sober, to stay alert basically. Now, I want to bring us to the book of Isaiah. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 21, verses 6 to 8. And here it says this, Meanwhile, the Lord said to me, Put a watchman on the city wall. Let him shout out what he sees. He should look for chariots drawn by pairs of horses and for riders on donkeys and camels. Let the watchman be fully alert. Then the watchman called out, Day after day, I have stood on the watchtower, my Lord. Night after night, 
I have remained at my post. And I think that's interesting right there because it talks about a watchman being fully alert and how day after day he is on watch, night after night this person has a post to be at. And if you move on later on in, in, in the book of Isaiah, again, Isaiah chapter 62, verses 6 to 7, it writes, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give Him no rest till He establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Now, very often when we look at this scripture, this scripture has a close relation to prayer as well. Because very often when we talk about being in prayer, we talk about this prayer tower, it's about us being on this duty, being on watch for what God is doing in the nations, being on watch from any kind of spiritual attacks that may come against our church, our communities, our nations, and to say, Lord, we will be on watch to stand against these things. Like I shared earlier on, there is spiritual warfare that is going on. And it's so interesting. Jesus says, keep watch. And in Scripture, we're reminded that, that we are to put watchmen on the city. We are to look out for, for, for what may come against us. And this is so very important for every single one of us. We must make it a point that, to keep watch. See, keeping watch and prayer, these are two things that come together. Early on, like I said, when we, what we learned from Indonesia that when we go for that time in that prayer tower, that prayer tower is not just to pray for our own needs, you know. It's not just to pray for what we want or to just run through a particular agenda. The idea there is to keep watch, to, to, to wait on the Lord, to discern what God is doing, doing in, in, in this time, in this season and to, to, in a sense, wage spiritual warfare against the spirit of darkness that is coming against the various ministries, against the various situations, to be praying against these things. So we must be on watch as well. And I like it that when you talk about being on guard or being on watch, you know, it's so interesting here that you want someone to be on guard continually. All right? You want people to be on watch continually. Okay? There's a certain importance right there. Can you, I mean, in Singapore's context, we're all familiar because of national service. We talk about total defense and everything. Can you imagine if our military force, our police force, or our civil defense, the paramedics, the firefighters, they, 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 have, a working, they have working hours? Right? Okay? Where, where, okay, if there's a fire, it will, we will only put out the fire from 8 to 5 or whatever it is. No, that, that doesn't make sense. No, they're on constant watch. Yes, they rotate among different units and so on, but there is constant watch going on. See, if we understand this, I mean, so let's talk about total, total defence. We can talk about total defence, economic defence, uh, military defence, psychological, whatever, all this social defence, all these different defence. What about spiritual defence? Well, as Christians, we should take this for our nation, for our church, for our communities, that this is something important, that we must rally behind this because we're praying not for ourselves, but we're praying for our nations. Yes, part of the agenda that we end up praying for ourselves, the things we're doing, but more than that, we're praying and keeping watch. We're standing guard for our church, for our leaders, for our nation to say, Lord, we will be on guard here, we'll be on watch, praying against spiritual attacks, praying against any works of darkness and praying more than that, that we'll rise up above these things and that we will fulfill the very things that God wants us to do. So these are the two things that I want to share with us. Today, I really want to talk about us. What is the significance behind our prayer tower? Why is this something significant? Well, I believe the prayer tower teaches us these two things. Number one, the importance of cell group prayer, the importance of prayer that is owned by the basic unit of the church. And number two, the importance of continuous prayer, that we are on watch day and night, night and day. We like to sing that song, right? Um, worthy of it all. You say, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Again, nice words to sing, but we must apply those words as well. We must live it out. We must action on these things as well. And so, we must come back to understand this. Today, I wanted to share this so that we, we have this understanding, we have this heartbeat on why it is that we are doing what we do at the prayer tower. And so, for now, I just want to, to, to move on and I want to talk about moving ahead. What's going to be happening from this point 
onwards. All right, what's going to be happening at this point onwards? Now, I just want to share with us some uh, a, a rough timeline on some things that have been happening from February all the way till now in April. All right. So if you look at this date, February 2020. All right, we started moving our night slots offsite. Now, this was done. Uh, it was actually done in a very hurried manner because this was done as an urgent response to the COVID-19 situation. At that point in time, it was just picking up. But we said we wanted to ensure that our people get sufficient rest. We don't make ourselves any more vulnerable than, than, than necessary in light of this entire virus. So we said, okay, during the daytime, we'll still make it a point to come down on-site, but the night moments will remain off-site. You heard about just more than a week ago at the end of March that we have moved completely off-site. This is in, in, uh, is in accordance to the government's latest uh, guidelines on this. So we, we have moved it off-site at the end of, of March. But at the start of April, all right, maybe some of the leaders and some of the team pastors will be more aware of this, that we launched an updated roster. Now, we had all along planned for a new roster to be rolled out in, from April 1st onwards. Now, for the leaders who recall at the final leaders meeting of 2019, I did mention that we are working on some changes on the prayer tower. Well, we have been working towards such that at, as of the second quarter of this year, so from, from April onwards, basically, that the prayer tower will take a new form of the daytime being on-site and the nighttime will, remain, will, will be something that is off-site. Now, why do we do that? Because we have been in constant dialogue with various leaders, we've been receiving feedback, we've been thinking about it, we've been praying about it, and we've been seriously considering what we can do. One of the things that have been raised is that uh, uh, there are, there are many, of, many of you out there that you, you have the heart for prayer and, and you have assured us that, that pastors were not trying to, 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 to get ourselves out of prayer or whatever. But there were some real concerns with the prayer tower, particularly the, the night slots, one being the safety and the well-being of our members. I mean, on one aspect you talk about, you know, waking up, not getting enough rest and many people having to go back to work. But other than that, we have, uh, we have some... Uh, younger people, we have some elderly, we have ladies and, and vulnerable groups who are, who are traveling by themselves at night. And we say that, hey, pastor, can we, can we reconsider this? And so we've really been thinking about it. We say, yes, let's, let's, let's see how we can improve, how we can change, because we want to make sure that we can, we can we do what is best for, for, to, to accomplish the purposes behind this. But at the same time, we do what is best to look out for the well-being of our, our members as well. And so we thought, okay, that's this, this, this something we want to work on. So we're working towards uh, April being launched of this new roster already. However, the whole thing had to be expedited from February onwards because of the whole COVID-19 situation. And right now, we are here in a completely off-site uh, 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 manner. Now, on this note, I just want to quickly, I just want to, 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 to mention this, that right now, Last week, I mentioned all the benefits of having an off-site uh, prayer tower. Yes, I do see a lot of benefits in it. But I will say this, eventually when this whole thing blows over, we will be bringing the prayer tower back on-site. During the day times, we'll be on-site. The night sessions will be off-site. We'll continue to review it and see how we can improve it. We, we do acknowledge there are many different ways we can improve uh, and we are constantly working on it. And this is something that we need to grow together as a church. Now, we eventually must bring it back. I'm going to explain this uh, 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 a little bit here. You see, I know we have said, well, Pastor, when we do all these things, we can, be, we can be seen as, there are many obstacles to it. Look, listen, every time we want to do anything for God, there'll be a million and one obstacles in, in our way. There, 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 there are always many, many different obstacles, okay? But as a faith community, how do we respond to these obstacles? Well, I wrote this one line down for us. We can either see the obstacles in our way or we can see the opportunities that are beyond those obstacles. It's up to us. We can just keep seeing the obstacles that are in our way or we can see the opportunities that are beyond these obstacles. So for example, us having to go off-site during this time, that is, a, that is an obstacle. But we choose to see the opportunities. That This is a time we can, we can mobilize more people. We can do all these different things. But finally, why is it that we will come back to bringing this prayer tower on site is because we must come back to this physical location. Now, in this season, we've been focusing a lot about how the church is one that is, is scattered. But let's understand this very clearly, okay? The church is both scattered and gathered. It is not an either-or kind of situation. And it's too simplistic for many of us to think that it's, a, it's an either-or thing. Because the truth is, it's not, it's not just here at FCBC, but among many 
Christians around in different churches. A lot of people have been saying, well, oh, now in this COVID-19 situation, this is the new way to do church. Everything can be, can be fully online. We don't have to have physical cell groups, we don't have to have physical service. Hey, if that's our response, then we've kind, of, we've kind of missed the plot right there, you know. The Bible talks about the scattered church. It also talks about the gathered church. It's both ends. The scattered church enhances the gathered church. The gathered church enhances the scattered church. It's not either or. Yes, there'll be some times we can own, it's only an either or situation. Like right now, it's an either or kind of situation. But that doesn't mean that when this is all over, we carry on that way. No, we must have both the gathered church and the scattered church. Both of these are equally important. That's why we must finally come back to, to, to coming back on site. If we read just now, we talk about being on watch. In Isaiah, it says, where, where, does the watchman, where do the watchmen do their duty? They are, the watchmen are on watch on the wall or in the watchtower. Okay, that's where, they, that, there is a place that they must do that. Like I said, yes, we've considered all the different things and we have heard these considerations and we think it's fair that yes, as much as possible, where, where, where it's possible, we should move the prayer tower off-site so that this prayer can continue, but yet we, we may en- ensure the safety and well-being of our people. But where it's possible, we must continue to gather for this on-site prayer. There is this place of being scattered. If just, just as how right now, there is a place for scattered worship. We are all worshipping in a scattered manner right now in our homes and so on. But are we therefore saying that we never want to have gathered worship anymore? We never want to come back to church to worship together again? No, these two things are not in competition. These two things are different. They serve specific purposes. They are both important. And if we think all that we need is scattered, then let's never have church again. Let's just always, let's just for the rest of our lives have, have online church, have scattered church. Let's never have cell groups again. But that's, that's not the application here. The application here is this. We are both gathered and we are both scattered. So like I said, in this point of time, when we're moving completely off-site, we're making some changes to the roster because we want to see the opportunities behind that. So last week, I talked about all this personal ownership. I talked about mobilization and all that. Yes, we can see that happening right now. That's why we're updating our prayer tower roster. So if you can see there's some changes we've made here. Number one, our prayer slots have been reduced to 30 minutes. Number two, we are mobilizing two people per slot. Number three, our slot assignments are based on cell strength. So for example, okay, uh, if a cell group has six people, you should be getting three slots. If you have 12 people, you should be getting six slots and so on, so forth. Now, we do understand as we roll it out, there'll be still some adjustments to be made. But the whole idea, right, is that if we participate like that, then everybody in the church pitches in, everybody plays their part. And if everybody plays their part, then this can be, this becomes something that we can carry. There's something that we can do. Because it's, no one person is bearing this. Like I said just now, continuous prayer is not something that one particular team or one particular person can carry, but when the whole church does it together, like I talked about last week, where many parts by one body, when the whole body does it together, we can ensure that it goes on. Now, what's the rationale for off-site slots being 30 minutes and mobilizing two people now? Because some people have said, but pastor, more people want to pray and, and so on and so forth. Well, what we're talking about here is the basic assigned duty okay your particular slot okay that is where we are we are assigning us to if more people want to do it by all means okay but officially on duty there'll be two people on duty at that point in time what's the reason behind this number one we want to maximize our manpower we want to make sure that that as many people are mobilized for this and it's not one particular group in fact i've been hearing a good thing based on this because previously Many of the cell groups, our push for, to the prayer tower, of, our push to prayer is always the bare minimum. We, oh, we need two people, need three people, we just get those people to go and pray. But there's some people who have never been en- engaged in prayer before. I know right now in our church, there are people who have been cell members for, well, a year or two or even more than that, but they barely go to the prayer tower. Why? Because there's always someone else who will take care of that. But now we, we are using this opportunity to say, hey, let's all be mobilized for prayer to maximize our man- manpower. The second reason why we have two people praying to a slot is to ensure that no one has to pray alone. I think it's not nice for us to have to pray alone. And, and I'm happy, I've been hearing from our, some of our groups, they are finding many different ways to connect. Some of them, they're praying together on WhatsApp, as in they're texting each other prayer items and they're praying, they're connected over WhatsApp. Some have, have called each other and they're praying. Some are doing video calls. They're using all sorts of means to remain connected. And that's great. So that nobody is praying uh, 
alone during that time. See, we can do this if our whole body comes together. But ultimately, yes, everything I'm saying here, there are a lot of operational aspects, there are, there are duties here. But finally, I want us to come back to the heartbeat behind the prayer tower. The heartbeat behind why we come and pray. The heartbeat behind the prayer tower is not a duty, you know. Yes, at the end of the day, it is actually a duty that we must fulfill, but the heartbeat cannot be that it's called a duty, that's why I must do it. The heartbeat behind it is this. Number one, we have a heart for our church. Number two, we have a heart for our communities. Number three, we have a heart for the nations. And number four, we have a heart for God's own heart. We come and we pray and we seek God because we want to say, God, teach me to love, teach me to serve our church, teach me to love and to serve our communities, teach me to love and to serve our nations. Lord, we want to keep them on our hearts. We want to pray over them. Lord, align our hearts. When we pray for a nation, we wait on God saying, God, show us what it is that we need to be praying over these nations. And maybe like, I know we've been talking about this, maybe sometimes we've, we've been a bit too restrictive in our, in our prayer agenda and we want to update this, we want to improve on it because we want to learn to wait on God. If we're praying for, for, for Singapore today, Lord, we want to wait upon you. What must we pray? What must we pray about? Yes, we've prepared an agenda, but Lord, lead us today. And very often I've been at the prayer tower and God places a specific word for that season. And we say, Lord, we're going to pray through this. And I believe that as we come back to what prayer is really all about, we're going to have a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit. I'm sure if I ask you right now, how many of you, you want an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon your lives, upon your families, upon your ministries, upon yourself, upon our church, upon every single thing we do? I'm sure many of us will say, yes, we want that outpouring. Well, then we must come back to what prayer is all about. This pastor by the name of Andrew Bonar, he says this, we must continue in prayer if we are to get an outpouring of the Spirit. Christ says there are some things that we shall not get unless we pray and we fast. Yes, prayer and fasting. We must control the flesh and abstain from whatever hinders direct fellowship with God. See, if you want an outpouring of the Spirit, we must continue in prayer. I believe the prayer tower is something significant that we must carry on with. And yes, we, there are many obstacles. Like I said, anytime we want to do something for God, there are a thousand and one, a million and one obstacles that are in our way. But do we see the obstacles or do we see the opportunities that are beyond those obstacles? Today, if we are a faith community, we must see beyond the obstacles. We must see the opportunities that God is giving to us. Yes, sometimes difficult to bring people to the prayer tower. There are a lot of different concerns. But what are the opportunities there? There's an opportunity for discipleship. It's an opportunity for us to rise up to the challenge. It's an opportunity for us to rise up in faith. So church, let's get rid of whatever hinders us, whatever is holding us back. Let's learn to grow through this. Let's press on and let's go to infinity and beyond. If we want to go to infinity and beyond, if we all receive that word, you know what? It's not just some nice slogan. We are not going to go to infinity and beyond if we are not committed to prayer. So church, that's what I want to call us to this weekend. The importance of prayer. Well, we're going to close this time worshipping the Lord, spending some time in, in prayer and responding in worship. But... We talk about this and there must be application. So we're going to pray and in that time of prayer, if some of you have needs, uh, uh, prayer requests, well, put it up in our live chat or, or send it to your cell group or send it to someone so that we can be praying together and the rest of us, we can be proactive as well. Ask the others around us, can I pray for you? Text your cell group, text whoever it is, send it up in the live chat, how can I pray for someone here? Just Let's just be connected in this time. But the other application we're going to do is I've been thinking about what we're going to do for next week you know, next week is actually Easter weekend. And uh, we're working on this and we're going to release some details. There are two things we're going to do over our Easter weekend. We may be separated, we may be physically apart, but yet in these combined moments, we can come together and worship the Lord and we can celebrate Easter. There are two things I want to do. Number one, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. All right? Now, the interesting thing here is this. Because we're not together, 
all of us we need to individually prepare our own Lord's Supper elements and maybe some of us we are new in the church but I remember growing up back in the day we used to prepare our own Lord's Supper elements when our cell groups uh, partook of, of the Lord's Supper I remember we will use Ribena use whatever kind of red coloured drink we can we can find to symbolise the, the 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 wine and then we'll find we'll go and buy Jacob's biscuit or Nug or whatever those those other biscuits table water whatever so we can use that as the as as the bread and and we need to prepare it together and I think it'll be great that we do that on our own and some of you as a family I think it may be the first time that you've actually you actually be partaking of the Lord's Supper together why because very often when it's Lord's Supper weekend, we are split up. Some of us, some of maybe our, the grandparents go to Chinese service or Hokkien service. The parents, you guys are in our main services. The kids or the youth, you're in youth service or in, in uh, 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 G Kids. But we've never come together as a family. I think it would be a good time. Let's prepare it together. I want to te- do a quick teaching on the significance of that and we'll partake of it. But the second thing I want to do is that I want next weekend to be a live prayer meeting now what do I mean by that do I mean that I'm bringing people here to TC no one we can't do that but I want to, it to be an interactive time where we're going to be praying for people so I want us to have a time where people can can surface their prayer requests and here wherever we are and the different places we're gathered we're going to be praying over those prayer uh, requests and so I want us to, to invite our friends to, to join us online you know? and they may not know uh, 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 the Lord as their Lord and Savior but it's fine it's just say do you have something to pray for we're going to find a way a platform for you to submit this prayer request and during that service we're going to pray over these requests as best as we can and, and we're still working on the details but I'm excited about that I think that's a great application we talk about getting serious about prayer then let's come and pray for one another so these are some things we're going to be doing next week and we're still working out how we can we can uh, uh, bring it about but yeah we're, we're just working this out but I'm excited about that but today as we talk about this church I, I, I don't even know whether to really call this a sermon or not I, I'm just here to share with you my heart I'm here to talk to us as, as, your, as your pastor I'm here to share with us a story of how this whole thing come, came about and maybe some of us we, we are we're not quite for the prayer tower maybe because we've never I, and I take that on, on myself as the leader of the church maybe we haven't spent enough time articulating why we got into it because the truth is this you know there was a fire when we started this prayer tower, people were excited, people were going there. But over time, this has waned. And maybe we've not done enough to articulate the, the purpose behind it, why we do it. We've not done enough to review it. Well, that's what we want to do right now. We want to change, we want to improve so that we can grow. I never want anything to stagnate in this church. Serena and I, we, we hate it when things stagnate. And same thing for prayer tower, we want it to grow. We want to, we want to grow from glory to glory. And we're gonna, we're gonna see what God has in store for us in this prayer tower. And so I wanna challenge us to be committed to this. To say, Lord, we're gonna keep this fire of prayer going in our church and in our nation. Why don't we just take this time to enter in a time of, of prayer? We're just gonna just be praying in the spirit. And some of you, if you need prayer, just ask someone to pray for you. And some of you offer to pray over somebody. Could be through text. Maybe right now the Lord placed a prompting in your heart to call out somebody right now. Call that person. Text that person. Release that word of blessing over that person. So let's just come at the count of three. Let's begin to pray and just begin to minister to one another. And the rest of us, let's just continue to pray in the spirit. Let's just pray in the spirit for at least two minutes because we, we need to learn this spiritual discipline of engaging our spirits, aligning our spirits with the spirit of God. So I'm going to count of three. At the count of three, let's just start praying right now. Ready? One, two, and three. Let's just press in. Let's press in. Let's continue to pray in the spirit. Another minute or so more. Let's 
Ora masala 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 Hora masala 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 If you are somehow still praying for somebody or connected with somebody, just continue to bless that person. But the rest of us, why don't we lift up our, our hands to the Lord? Lord, we thank you for this reminder this weekend on the importance of prayer, on the importance of coming together as small groups, as the basic unit of a church to own this spirit of prayer. Lord, we thank you that together as a family, we are able to keep this continuous prayer going. So Lord, we ask for a new spirit upon each and every one of us. Renew our minds, refresh us, revitalize us, restore us to what prayer is all about. And Lord, I pray that this church will be a community of faith that will rise up in prayer, not just for ourselves, but for the larger church, for the community around us, for the nations that are all around. Lord, teach our hearts to be aligned with your hearts. And so, church, I bless each and every one of you. That as you seek the Lord, that your eyes will be fixed on Him, the author and the perfecter of your faith. So, Lord, we commit ourselves into your hands. We thank you for all this. In your most precious name, we pray. Amen and amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, God bless all of you. Thank you for joining us here at our stream this morning. And uh, just so you know, later at 11.30am, there'll be another stream. It'll be our Chinese service. It'll be in uh, Mandarin and Hokkien. So if you do have friends who are Mandarin or Hokkien speaking, invite them to come and join us for, for this live stream. But for the rest of us, have a great week ahead. Uh, stay safe. Just continue to do our part in serving the nation during this time. And just... Be, just be mindful that next weekend will be Easter weekend and we look forward to releasing more details on you as to how this service will take place. So God bless you. Have a great week ahead of you. May the Lord watch you and keep you. God bless you. <laughs>